All right. Welcome back, everybody. Man, I am, once again, we've got, you know, another awesome word. God is, uh, he's bringing something back to us, actually. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I love it when he does that. But let me um, ask you this, and y'all give me some, uh, you know, give me, give me some ideas. I want you to come off mute when I ask this question. But uh, how do you feel when you're confused? What does it feel like to be confused? What are some of the other emotions that come along with it? Frustration. Stress. Stress. Not being in control. What'd you say, Don? Not being in control. Not being in control. Feeling stuck. Stuck. Stagnant. In What'd you say? Insecure. Insecure. Those are all good. Very, uh, you know, very true. Here's my next question. What if you could make the enemy feel that way? Ooh, I love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, right Amen. Amen. You know, the word that the Lord gave me today, this morning was tactics. Yeah. Okay. And um, I think that we, uh, you know, sometimes we think about, well, here's what he said. We have to be very aware of the tactics that the enemy is using. And there's another phrase that he gave to me and, or, or that I re, you know, I was reminded of, and that is, have y'all ever heard the term turnabout is fair play? What does that mean? That means whatever tactic somebody uses on me, it's okay to use it on them. <laughs> okay. That's what he said. Turnabout is fair play. And he was talking about tactics here. And so he, Second uh, Corinthians 2 and 11 and um, I'm looking at the NIV here, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 2 and 11. This is actually part of a, a letter that Paul was writing to the church of Corinth. And it was after some messiness had gone down. <laughs> okay. So messiness had gone down. He sent a, a letter. He says that this letter was pretty mean, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but he was trying to get everybody back into alignment. And, um, before this, he was talking about how, you know, a particular person needed to be forgiven and, excuse me, and so 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, in order, so he's talking about forgiveness here, but he says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And this is what the Lord is bringing forward to us today. He's talking about tactics that are used against you and how to turn around and use those against the enemy. Because a lot of times there are things that we, um, we again, we experience and just think that they are a part of natural life. And we are not really aware that they are also tactics that the enemy is using. And so that's why I asked you that question about confusion, because I want you to really be aware of that tactic of the enemy and all the other tentacles that come along with it when he's using that against you. And the fact is that God gave us a weapon that allows us to make him make the enemy feel that way. <laughs> it's not just something that sounds good to do because it, it's a, you know, it's a good Christian thing. Again, he wants you to understand the power that you have to turn these tactics against the enemy. Turnabout is fair play. <laughs> okay. And what are some of the other tactics that the enemy uses? Well, you know, think about the spiral of events that can happen. He uses anger. You know, anger turns into bitterness. Anger can turn into, it can turn, it, it can become, uh, you know, something. Now we have unforgiveness. Don't, things like worry. You know, we hear some bad news. Um, we, then he knows we're going to go into worry. He knows worry affects our health. So it's a big old cycle. All of these things become a big cycle that don't just, you, you see how what the enemy is using, the things that do not appear, he's using the things that we can't even put our hands on, which is emotions, and he's making them affect us spiritually, mentally, and physically. He uses those tactics to do so. Fear, anger, doubt, 
Let me tell you, overeating, okay? Busyness, staying too busy to, to take the time out to order your day in the way in which God wants you to do. Um, indifference, just not even caring left or right what happens. Uh, Self-sabotage, okay? All of these things are tactics that are being used. And so um, he brought me back to, this is why I have, I have told you and given you praise as a weapon, because we already see in the Bible where the example of praise being a weapon, excuse me, uh, confuses the enemy. And, you know, the thing is, he, the, let's look at Psalms 34 and one. And this is an amplified Psalms 34 and one. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. God says, this is not just a good thing to give you some warm and fuzzies. Your, his praise continually in, in your mouth. That means that you are putting the enemy in a continual state of confusion. Let me ask you this, because I think it was Natalie who said, confusion makes you feel stagnant. How can the enemy keep his onslaught going against you when he's confused? How he When he can't even locate you because he doesn't even know what's happening. You see, and this is what the Bible's, this is what God is saying. <laughs> he can't use these tactics against you when he's in confusion. And he deliberately created praise as a way. Now, is it just because he wants you to, you know, fake it? Because <laughs> do we always feel like praising? No, but Psalm says it should continually be on our mouth. Why? Because in the moments when we don't feel like praising and we're being, we're in the middle of the attack, he's trying to tell you, I'm trying to get you out. I'm trying to get the attack to stop. You know, I, uh, th this is one of those, believe me, we all have the times where we don't feel like it, but do you see how that's a tactic of the enemy that for you not to feel like praising? Because he knows that if you start to do so, he's got to leave. He will lose his grip. He knows it. So let me bring about confusion. Let me bring about all of these other emotions we just talked about. So that way you won't find it in you to lift up a praise. Long as you're sitting there right where I want you. And see, this is what God is saying. We are not unaware of the enemy's tactics. And so when we don't feel like praising, we find a way to still do so. We find a way to lift up praise. Okay, let's look at, let's look at something. We're going to look at this example. This is how praise can release us. Because he, when the enemy's tactics come in, when he uses these things, he puts you in this box. He puts you in a prison, okay? Uh, just like he did Paul, excuse me, and Silas. And so let's look at Acts uh, 16. And let's see. I am trying to see where I started here. Hold on. We're going to go to, we're going to go from 16. Acts 16, verse 16, and we're going to go all the way down till, till that um, chapter is done. So it's a little bit of a haul here, but let's get it. Let's get it. Let's do it, right? <laughs> okay. So Acts 16, 16, and I'm in the Passion. Um, pretty much the other, all the translations read about the same for this one. But it says, one day, as we were going to the house of prayer, we encountered a young slave girl who had an evil spirit of divination, the spirit of Python. She had earned great profits for her owners by being a fortune teller. She kept following us, <clears throat> shouting, these men are servants of the great high God, and they're telling us how to be saved. Day after day, she continued to do this. So she continued mocking, okay? Day after day, she continued mocking until Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit indwelling her, I command you in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to come out of her now. And at that very moment, the spirit came out of her. When her owners realized that their potential of making profit had vanished, they forcefully seized Paul and Silas and dragged them off to the city square to face the authorities. 
Now, just a side note here. Remember, we've talked about the, the difference between the vision for your business. These people were business owners. The vision for your business, but the spirit that underlies your business are two different things. And in here, they were using a spirit sent by the enemy to build their business. Okay. And that enemy, that spirit can come in a lot of different forms. Like poverty could be a driver for business. Greed could be a driver for business. And so Paul recognizes the spirit and he, he, you know, he tells the spirit to leave. Well, look what happens after that. Now, I want you to think about these things, not just what's happening in the story, but um, how how this is playing out. Um, is it good news or is it bad news for Paul <laughs> and Silas, right? Are they, um, you know, are they having a great day or are they having a bad day? Okay. <laughs> You know, think about some of those things. It says when uh, when they appeared before the Roman soldiers. So here they are. Paul and Silas had just relieved this girl of a spirit that had been tormenting her, obviously, for years. She had been um, under the the enslaved to these people who owned her. OK, in order to use her for profit, Paul fr frees her. OK turns the tables basically against the plot the enemy had to use this girl in this region, okay? So now the enemy's like, okay, bet. When they appeared before the Roman soldiers, so now this is all being fueled by tactics of the enemy because it said these, these, these owners were mad, okay? This is again a tactic. They're upset. They drag Paul and Silas. Now, I want you to imagine having just done the work of the Lord, being snatched up by your collar and dragged out or hauled off to court. <laughs> Is that a good day? Probably not. Doesn't feel like it, does it? Probably doesn't feel like it. <laughs> it says, when they appeared before the Roman soldiers and magistrates, the slave owners leveled accusations against them saying, these Jews are troublemakers. They're throwing our city into confusion. So the enemy comes in in this tactic. One, he starts to lie on them because they weren't Jews, okay? He starts to lie on them. He says, they're throwing our city into confusion. They're throwing all this stuff out of proportion because they're losing money. And it says, they're pushing their Jewish religion down our throats. It's wrong and unlawful for them to promote these Jewish uh, ways. And for we are Romans living in a Roman colony, Okay, and it says a great crowd gathered and all the people joined in to come against them. The Roman officials ordered that Paul and Silas be stripped of their garments and beaten with rods on their bare backs. So are they having the time of their life today? They have been stripped. They are being beaten. And it goes on to say after they were severely beaten. So you can you imagine how many bruises are on their body right now? how they've got to be feeling internally, you know, spiritually, mentally, how much of a weight is, is, are they having to carry right now? Excuse me. It says they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them securely. So the jailer placed them in the innermost cell of the prison and had their feet bound and chained. So now they're probably bloody. They probably got swollen eyes, swollen head, swollen you know, everything. They probably got gashes in their body at this point. And then they get their feet bound. But what does it say? What's the next scripture we see? It says, Paul and Silas undaunted prayed in the middle of the night and sang songs of praise to God while all the other prisoners listened to their worship. Imagine that that's the day you're having. Okay. At the end of that day, do you think you would feel like singing songs of praise? God gave us the praise, not just as a, something that makes him feel good. It shifts our perspective of about who is in control in this moment. It reminds us that I have a God who has set precedent already over whatever situation I'm facing. It reminds me that I have a God who already sealed my victory. The praise takes this burden out of my hands and shifts it to him. And then it causes release 
from the prison. We see what happens right here. It says, suddenly a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison and, and at, all at once, every prison door flung open and the chains of all the prisoners came loose. You see, this praise not only loosed Paul and Silas, it loosed everybody, <laughs> everybody that was there with them. You see, praise is an atmosphere changer. It can't, the, the environment can't help but to line up when, when you're around and you're giving praise. And that is something that spills over and bleeds over into everybody that you're with. You see, it is it is the release. It confuses the enemy. All of a sudden, the enemy's tactics become null and void here. It didn't matter what he tried to do before. They have to be released. You think God doesn't desire to come out on the scene on behalf of you? He absolutely does. But our job is to go take the situation, pull it out of our hands and give it to him. And here he is, he releases the earth shook, the earth itself shook as, as a consequence of their praise, because what was going to have to happen? He was going, they were going to have to be released, period. Whatever God has to do to bring finality of victory into that situation, it happens. And that turnaround is praise. It says, startled, the jailer awoke and saw every cell door standing open and that all the prisoners had escaped. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself when Paul shouted in this darkness, stop, don't hurt yourself. We're all still here. The jailer called for a light. When he saw that they were still in their cells, he rushed in and fell, trembling at their feet. I mean, now not only does the praise release, but it creates you, it, it causes you to be a testimony because of what happens on your behalf when that battle shifts, when you recognize who's Lord, when you recognize who's in charge, it becomes your, your own battle cry. And here we see this soldier, this jailer, he says, what must I do to be saved? How can I get God to move on my behalf like he just moved for you? It was necessary that this jailer see Paul and Silas chained up, beaten, had had the wor one of the worst days of their life. It was necessary that they went through that and it brought salvation. It says they answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your family. And, say, and they prophesied the word of the Lord over him and all his family. Even though the hour was late, he, the jailer, then becomes this vessel in which it ministers now to Paul and Silas. It says that he washed their wounds. He fixed them up. You see, this is, this is, a, this is a tactic of God's to take what the enemy tried to use as a way to bring you down into submission. Now that praise not only confuses him, but it makes him have to get in line repay, repair what you damaged. That's what praise is doing here. And so the jailer starts to dress his wounds, dress their wounds, brings them back, fixes them up. And it says, then he and all his family were baptized, even though it was late. It said, he took Paul and Silas into his home and set them at his table and fed them. Does Psalms 23 not say you make a table in front of my enemies, right? Here it is in real life. The jailer says, come to my house and eat. The very thing, the very man that was in charge of holding them hostage. And how often have we let fear hold us hostage? Confusion hold us hostage. Frustration hold us hostage. How often have we done that? And God says, you can take your praise and you can turn it about. Put, set the enemy out on his own track of confusion. And what has to happen is that release for you. And everything that tried to come against you now has to serve you. It now, this is a tactic, y'all. It's not just a feel good, warm, fuzzy. This is a tactic. Do not, don't, don't be unaware of what the enemy is using and the fact that you can use it against them.
you have to be aware of that so you can implement it. It says, <laughs> excuse me, the jailer and all his family were filled with joy in their newfound faith in God. At daybreak, the magistrates, now this is interesting, okay? It says, at daybreak, the magistrates sent officers to the prison with the orders to tell the jailer, let those two men go. The jailer informed Paul and Silas, the magistrates have sent orders to release you. So you're free to go now. Now this is, look at all this, all this had happened and the, they, they just give a little, okay, go ahead and get out of here. Okay. Go ahead and get out of here. And here's what Paul said. He stands up, goes back at it. He says, look, Paul told the officers, let me tell you something. They beat us in public without a fair trial. And we are Roman citizens. Do you think we're going to quietly walk away after they threw us in prison and violated all of our rights? Absolutely not. You go back and tell the magistrates they need to come down here themselves and escort us out. Paul was like, nah, it ain't going down like that, homie. You get your boys down here and they are going to make a show because y'all try to make a show out of us. We're going to make a show out of you. Okay. You see this, this all started with praise. When the enemy tried to throw that block up in there, when the enemy tried to stop them from doing what they had been put here to do, this all came out of the tactic of praise. And see, that's what the enemy, he's like, I'm going to make a spectacle of you. I'm going to make sure you get embarrassed. I'm going to make sure that people think, oh, you're, that's, they, they ain't never going to get out of that one. And Paul's like, let me tell you about my God. Let me let you know this. You ain't going to embarrass me. He showed up on my behalf. And guess what? Everybody, you're going to have to take back everything you said, everything you did, because I'm walking out of here and you're going to be the one to escort me. I love it. Ruthless, man. Be ruthless with the enemy. It's okay. Whatever, you know. I keep thinking about, well, let me read the rest of this. It says, when the, uh, when the officers went back and reported with Paul what Paul and Silas had told them, the magistrates were frightened, especially upon hearing that they had beaten two Roman citizens without due process. See, they they were taking on the the enemy, the lies that, that everybody was telling on them, the enemy lying to these officials. Nobody ever considered that. And now they're like, oh, we did mess up. We messed up on that one. Okay. And they said, so they went to the prison and apologized to Paul and Silas begging them repeatedly saying, please leave our city. So Paul and Silas left the prison and went back to Lydia's house where they met with the believers and um, comforted and encourages them before, um, you know, before departing. So you know, these, these soldiers here, these officials had to go and, and fall in line, you know, they had to go fall in line and it all started with praise. It makes its way back around again. When the enemy tries to use these tactics as ways to dishonor you, as ways to make you take you out of here, as ways to make you get confused, we get to turn that around on him. And then he has to come back and repay. He has to come back and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to make him feel the way he made you feel. You know, that's the only time we can be, uh, we can be okay with get, with some get back. <laughs> okay. Is when we put in that enemy in line. So, you know, I just, I wanted to remind you, God wanted to remind you today. You have that weapon. It is all throughout the Bible that that praise is a turning point. Whatever the situation may look like, praise is always the turning point. It's the catalyst that changes everything. And he tells us, let it continually be on your lips because it is a way to keep the enemy continually at bay in your life. Use the tactic you're given. Use it so that the enemy has nowhere to set his foot he has nowhere to plant his flag. Continually keep him confused. Okay. And one other thing that, you know, when you feel like you don't feel like praising and listen, y'all, believe me, I've been in that place where it's like, Lord, I can't take not one more thing. 
I can't, I don't even know how you see what I'm saying. Like, and, but, but when you begin to recognize that it is the tactic of the enemy to keep trying to pour things on you. So you stay in a cycle of worry or you stay in a cycle of anxiety. And, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday who, well, they were just kind of spiraling out of control with, with things that were going on in their life. And it's not that those things weren't happening. I get it. But do you have to live there? No. I said, what do you, do you want me to just say, let's just go die together? I mean, what do you want me to do? If you follow your train of thought, okay, if you keep following that train of thought, where's that going to take you? Nowhere but defeat. Okay. So we have to make a decision to be aware of what the enemy is doing so that you can make the decision to pull yourself out because you've got to get out of the prison unless you want to stay there. And if you want to stay there, I cannot stay there with you. Okay. I cannot stay there with you. I will help you out if you're ready to come out. But we can't sit in that place because the enemy, that's you being bound with the chains. That's you being continually whipped. You're, let, you, you're continuing to allow him to stay in that space and praise. Even when you don't want to do it, we'll turn it around. How can I get myself to even come to, even if your heart is heavy and you don't feel like it, pull out a, a psalm. Pull out a psalm and read it. Just let your lips, let the praise come out of your lips and watch it begin to change. You will feel something lift and shift like that if you will allow yourself to do it and don't let yourself keep getting piled on. You see, so it is. And these are things all I, I had to learn, too. I can't let you. You're not about to change what I am, you know, what God has for me by trying to keep me in some cycle. You're not going to do it. You see, because see, you have wore it too long. You have wore it too well to come to a place in which now we give up. He's done too much up until this point. So start somewhere. Start with reading a psalm. Start with listening to praise music and allowing yourself to sing with it. I don't care if you're crying through the whole thing. Let it be continually on your lips because that's how you stand up one foot at a time. That's how you start to set that enemy of flight and all of a sudden things lift and God has to come and shake the earth on your behalf. Man, call somebody that you don't want to call that you know is going to give you a word. Knowing you don't want to hear it, get on the phone anyway, okay? Let God, put God in it because he wants to be in the position to shake this earth on your behalf. He wants to be in position to make you a testimony that makes those who try to persecute you have to serve you. He wants that for you. He wants to do it, right? Amen, amen. All right, I think I'm done.